The people who did much for God were people who were driven and extremely passionate. Is it a wonder that David could be running from Saul and have two women? Is it a wonder that Solomon in all his greatness had a thousand wives, literally, because a concubine was a wife. She was just not on his level. And if you check through from Samson and run through all the way, you will find that people who succeeded for God had drives. Woo! <laughs> As I grew up, I was, and I grew up in church. Uh, the church wasn't in me, but I grew up in church. And uh, it seems as if more than anything, I, they had a set of rules to follow. And uh, there was great, great, great conflict because I knew I was going to hell. <laughs> but I couldn't follow these rules. I don't know if you've ever had that, that, that problem. Um, somehow, I, I wanted to be a good guy. And I wanted to do the right thing. But it seems as if I didn't have the capacity to eliminate from my innermost being these drives to fulfill what was a great part of me. I, 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 I found that I could be really spiritually inclined right after I did something wrong. I, I want to talk to some real people today. No, no, I really don't. If you ever wanted to see me in a, in a, in a mode of penitence and, and, and with a righteous ebullient drive, it always happened after I was wrong. Immediately after I was wrong, I wanted to do right. But leading up to the action that was wrong, I allowed myself the indulgence. I've since found that, and it's another quandary, it's quite a conundrum, and that is that the people who are most likely to succeed are people who are extremely passionate. Because in order to get from point A to point B in the time in which we live, and with the things that we have to overcome and go through, anybody who lacked any real drive could not make it. In order for you to fulfill your destiny or your purpose, you have to be driven. The kind of person who does not take no for an answer. The kind of person who can think something through and find a way to get it. 
the kind of person who isn't likely to back down because of opposition. The kind of person who will drive you through the night and into the next day. The kind of person who can keep 20 people tired. <laughs> because they intend to get to point A, no matter what comes their way, they're passionate and full of drive. Now here's the problem. It takes drive to fulfill my destiny. It takes passion to go after what it is I want to achieve. And incidentally, if you check the Bible out, the people who did much for God were people who were driven and extremely passionate. Is it a wonder that David could be running from Saul and have two women. <laughs> Is it a wonder that before he got to Jerusalem while he was in Hebron, he had seven wives. And by the time he got to Jerusalem, they couldn't even count. Mm -hmm. Is it a wonder that Solomon in all his greatness had a thousand Wives, literally, because a concubine was a wife. She was just not on his level. And if you check through from Samson and run through all the way, you will find that people who succeeded for God had drives. Woo. Anybody who is not driven couldn't be like Paul. Anybody who isn't driven couldn't be like Peter. And it's God who sets the drive in you to achieve. How many folks have you walked away from because they didn't have any drive? Couldn't hang with you. Paul said, don't send this guy with me. I don't need John Mark with me. He fell out with Barnabas over John Mark. I don't want him with me because the guy is too soft. He does not know how to get things done. He will not press his way through. Anybody who is going to be anything for God has got to have drive. The only problem with that is Satan knows you have it. And the devil doesn't want you without your drive. He just wants every now and then to focus it somewhere else. <sighs> I want you to make a note of this, that it's, it is not your failures that are going to be hard to manage. It's your success that's going to be difficult to manage. Because when God moves you with your drives from the level where you are now to the level that he's going to take you, and as you climb up and it takes less power of drive to get off the ground, what are you going to do with the rest of the passion? You're driving now. When I first started a church, oh, I'm, on a, I'm, having, I'm having a good time. When I first started a church in Longview, Texas, and I had just a few people, I would lay out before God, fasting and praying, and calling on God to build it. Build it, Lord. Study four or five hours every day seven to ten hours on Saturday reaching for everything God had to give me because most of the fuel is spent in an airplane when it's coming off the ground ah but now that it has flown up to a certain height and I don't have to pray so hard to get a message and I don't have to lay before God all day, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday to hear from God. Then I had only one sermon. Now I have to choose the right one to preach. 
Now I can relax and look around. And what do you do with the passion that's still there, but's not needed over here? And so the more successful you become, the more dangerous you are with passions floating around nesting on the inside of your system trying to find some place to release itself if you're going to make it you gotta have drive but the drive on the one hand can be the greatest thing to help you to maintain or achieve your purpose but that same drive and passion and that same ingenuity and ability to gain and sagacity and wisdom to gain what it is you have always gone after, if it ever redirects itself and it points to the wrong thing at the wrong time, you're going to have a fight on your hands. I want to talk to some real people here. Somebody's fighting right now. I have been in fights, yes, when I knew what was right to do. And I fought against what was wrong to do because it got in the way of my passion and my purpose. And I fought. And I fought. And I fought with everything I have. And I struggled with everything in my mind. And then suddenly, I let it go. I have found you can allow your passion to get you into something in 15 minutes that it will take you 15 years to get out of. Because the drive is still there. Now add to this drive, which is your lust, because temptation is made up of two things. You got to have lust or desire. And then you got to have enticement. The devil brings enticement to the table, but he doesn't bring desire. You bring desire to the table. Don't look at me like Alice in Wonderland. We're going to have some conversation. We need to talk real up in there. <laughs> you bring desire to the table. And the desire is proper because nobody in here has a desire that is natural, that is not God-given. Without the natural desire, you would not be ambitious enough to keep struggling. Without the natural desire, you would not have a proclivity, a tendency to love the opposite sex. You cannot be heterosexual unless there is a drawing, there is a pulling. You could, not be, yeah, you, you could not be even an inordinate homosexual if there was not a pulling. There is a desire. You bring desire to the table. Desire is not wrong. Huh. You thought it was wrong to desire a man or desire a woman. No, it's not wrong. It is proper to desire the opposite sex. God made it like that. Yes. Yes. It is proper to look at some beautiful lady and declare she's beautiful. And I'd like to get to know you. It is proper to look at a man that's good looking and admit he's good looking. And if, and, and if I were married and a good looking man walked by and said to my wife, that's a bad man right there. Uh, that's a bad man. She wouldn't have to tell me. I'd tell her before it came out of her mouth. That's a bad man. Because if a fine lady comes by, I'm going to tell her, now that's fine right there. That's fine. Come on, let's go home. It's proper to desire 
Because it's in desire that you implement and move and drive. So bringing desire to the table is not a sin to desire. That's where they messed me up when I was growing up. Because they made me feel like something was wrong with me because I felt this way. It wasn't nothing wrong with me. After I got to a certain age, I didn't want to be with my mama. I wanted to be with some other person. Natural. What sin is, is taking a legitimate desire and using it in an illegitimate manner. Oh, I feel God in this place. That's all sin is. So don't sit around condemning yourself because you feel it. You know, somebody used to tell me growing up in church, well, if you feel it, you might as well do it. The devil is a liar. Because I feel it don't mean I ought to do it. Now it's time to fight. So because you're already condemned, because you're feeling it, you release the struggle, and you do it. And now you have complicated your circumstance because now you're bonding where you don't need to bond. See, if there's going to be a climax, the climax should be after you get to know the person and not before. And so consequently now, the lust is here, and, it's, and I brought it. Now many times, church people, they testify, and they'll tell you, well, you know, I was so-and-so approached me, and, and, and the Lord just brought me out. Yeah, thank God. Uh, I, just, I just looked at him like, uh, you must be crazy. And I, I just stood for the Lord. And I just stood for God. And, and I was just not going to have that at all. I was saved and sanctified. Most people testify about who approached them and they didn't want them. Because if I don't desire a particular thing or person, you could give it to me. And as soon as you turn your back, I'd either give it away or sell it. There is no real intensity of enticement when there is no strong desire. The stronger the desire, the easier the enticement. And that's what Satan does. All Satan wants to know is what level of frustration did you get up with this morning because I got a package that'll fix that frustration level if I get a chance to present it. Oh, I want to talk to some real people here. I, oh, I, I, I'm going to preach lust in a minute. I'm just going to preach it. <laughs> to simply tell yourself, I'm not feeling this way when you are, is allowing yourself to become extremely vulnerable to the devil. Because one of the things we do is we lie to ourselves. You know you don't have the capacity to feel the way you feel right about Friday night. Because sometimes it just comes on without solicitation. A man can be just totally without thought as he's going his way, doing his everyday business. And all of a sudden you come into his scope and he goes there immediately. I mean, you didn't fan the flame. You didn't, it just got hot instantly. Just, it just instantly and, and, and just went out of control on an instant. He didn't plan it. He didn't, it's it just the, mm, just, it just spontaneously came out of his mouth without even a thought or a plan.
drawn away by his own peculiar idiosyncratic lust. We all don't feel the same type and we all don't feel the same intensity. Some folks weren't sexually inclined before they got saved. Hey Amen. Don't you get to bragging about how celibate you've been all these years. You were celibate before you got saved. That wasn't a sin that so easily beset you. Amen. But you're still lying, ain't you? Ain't no sense of me playing with you. A man's reaction is real quick. He didn't think about it. He didn't, he, it just, mm, it just hit him, bam. So I got up to preach one time. <laughs> Open the Bible, about to preach. That's why I quit people walking in offerings. Pass the plate, please. Don't let them pass by this pulpit. I'm trying to get my mind on the Lord up in here. Boom! It just hits you. And then you think about it for three or four minutes, and then you say, loose your heart. It's a unique lust. It's, a, it's, it's, it's idiosyncratic. It belongs exclusively to you. Drawn away by his own. A woman who has a modicum of training. Un petit peu. Just of training. If she feels it, she will mask it. And if she ever gives in, she would have thought about it for two or three weeks. Yes, yes. Yes, the next time he approached me like that. And then you see. See, the devil then understands the differences. And so in the man's case, he can hit him with an instant fix. In the woman's case, he allows her to cook a little while. Yes, 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 yes. Because the devil does not waste time with bringing you who you don't want. Oh, oh, oh touch your neighbor and say, he'll bring you your type. And sometimes what he does is, like the fella on the train in the old days who had a big card in front of him with all different kinds of things on it. 
And he'd walk around in the train and ask, do you want Coca-Cola? Do you want candy? Do you know I don't want that? Dog? But he'd keep on calling stuff. <laughs> Until he found out what you wanted. Oh, it's easy to get up here bragging and testifying about all the folk you got through and got over and the Lord just brought you out. But there's somebody you ain't saying nothing about. Oh, I feel a little churchy in here. has never been who wanted me. My problem has always been who I wanted. And when you have been raised not to take no for an answer. It don't take much enticement. <sighs> I've been sent back up on the stage. This might be too frightening. <laughs> I want to see the white of your eyes. <laughs> the single most difficult thing is to take sight in an intense temptation and replace it by a relationship with God. I, I want you to think about this now because we, 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 we're, we're a church full of platitudes and we can say things so quickly and so easily. But the real battle is to understand that when I have to switch from what I'm feeling to what I'm believing, uh, can, can I take it just a little further? I don't want to make it too intense. Uh, I don't want to make it too intense. The thing that makes it even harder to maintain one's chastity as a child of God and purity from the top to the bottom is availability. swim through snake infested waters climb over a 20 foot tall barbed wire fence walk through rats and climb over a mountain two miles to get to what I wanted, I might. Well, I don't know, but I think I, I might go back. I might go back. I might somehow get so sick of what it took to get to it that I might say, you know what, I'm going to give up on this going back to doing what God told me to do. <laughs> Lord, I'm glad you made it hard for me so I can go back to doing what you told me to do. But what Satan does is Satan says, oh, you ain't got to work that hard to get it. All I want to know is what your order is and I will deliver it to your doorstep. The thing that destroys most of us is a fail. 
lability. Come on, brothers. Come on, sisters. When you're trying to make it with God, and you're trying to bring your drives under control, and in the midst of you trying to bring your drives under control, Satan's got everything you like available. You could have escaped if it wasn't so available. And not only available, but insistent. Come on, talk to me now. Talk to me. And you know it's lust different from love when somebody did everything in their power to get to you and now you can't understand why they won't even call you anymore. I want to talk to some real people now. This is, this is getting real tough in here now. You can almost hear a rat licking ice in here now. Somebody remind me when I close today to close on this note that God is always right. He's always right. Because the more valuable you become, the more vulnerable you are. Because when you get valuable in the house of God, God takes the thug out of you. You ain't no thug no more. Used to be you could fight and thug your way out of circumstances. But the thug is gone now. Because you're closer to the Lord. And you're trying to walk in his precepts. Used to be, you would just upside somebody's head and get over it. But now you feel foolish because you have allowed your desire to introduce an enticement and allow an enticement that you've given into that has nowhere to go. Part of the power of being single and staying chaste is deciding, I don't want to get into anything that won't be permanent. And if it's to be permanent, can I talk to you? then I need to know something other than the body. So why don't we just put a hold on the body till I check out your mind? Because it's real funny how we do it. We, 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 we get angry when people uh, ultimately don't have anything to do with us. But they never did get to know us. They knew our bodies first. Oh, you know how we lead. I'm coming to pick you up. I'm going to find the best car I've got in my driveway if I even have to borrow one. I'm going to put on the meanest suit to accent my physical features. I'm going to call the restaurant ahead and set it up so wonderfully. Call and make sure that the maitre d' who's on the table, who's on the door today. And, all right, uh, I'm coming at about 2.30 and I want everything in place. And uh, You can't get ready in 15 minutes. You need three or four hours, maybe half a day. You just can't get any clothes out the closet. You just might go buy a new one just for this occasion. And oh, do we pull up. Oh, and you just got it accented and just everything right. Whatever you have to borrow to put on, you just do it. At the end of the day, 
you're hurt three months later because everybody wants me for my body. And I'm sitting in the corner mad. Everybody wants me for my money. But you didn't show me anything but your body, and I didn't show you anything but my money. But if it's going to be permanent, I need to know you all the way through so we can hold on to sex. What Satan has done is, he has set us in a world that feeds lust. He has set us in a world that stimulates desire. He doesn't even have to come into it anymore and bring any imp into our world. He doesn't have to send demons now because he set the world up to feed lust. And sometimes we're moving around and don't even know that we've just imbibed some subliminal message that Satan has sent our way. If you remember the repressive Victorian age, uh, we could then classify lust uh, as, as a little fox, but there is absolutely no way to place it in that category today. We've graduated from the regressive Victorian puritanicalism to what I might call today the obsessive American obscenity. What we've got is new morality and we've got a new distinction today of sexuality. It's moved from the most perverse and obnoxious form. It's been extricated from the closet and it's now on the billboard. Uh, one writer says that maybe our predilection with sex is because of our fear of death. And so we move to the creative aspect in order to get away from the aspect of dying. So we use the power of creating life. And we have interwoven sexuality into our society. And now our society is just totally lust craved. It's woven into the fabric of beauty. It's woven into the fabric of youth. If you talk about beauty, it talks about sex. If you talk about youth, you talk about sex. It's woven into the fabric of health. And it's woven into the fabric of wealth. It's, it, it, lust and sex are so central that we wake up with it every day on the daily soaps. And we lead into it on the nightly soaps. It's now become the central theme of our industry. The movie industry who wants to watch a movie if it's not R rated ain't enough action so what's happening now is we're imbibing this let, let me just read something uh, angry at Susan for continually drinking and lack of care for Jason Alan decides he wants custody of his son an idea Monica abhors Heather decides to move in with Scotty but Scotty decides to move in with Susan Leela tells Edward she knows all about his illegitimate son after going to bed with Rose Mark realizes he's not over the death of his wife Katie, Claudia's parents are against her marrying Brian. There it is. That's just the soaps, you know. And so Satan just subliminally feeds us the soaps and he feeds us sex in advertising. Wasn't it Luther who said, busybody, uh, uh, giving all your love to anybody. It, uh, one writer came along and sung a song. What does love have to do with it? Because it was so free love and so much sex and so much lust and everybody going after everybody that you can hardly shake somebody's hand now without them looking you up and down. And, and ain't nobody thinking about love. They're just thinking about getting it on. I feel like preaching now. And, and so now when you feel good about yourself and you elevate yourself to another level, you've got to watch who you allow in your space. Uh, you've got to let folk know there's more to me than just just my pulchritude and I'm not letting you up in my space if you're not intending to explore my intellect explore uh, my sagacity explore who I really am it ain't not about me performing it's about who I am oh I feel it here give somebody a high five and say control yourself touch your neighbor and say you got more to offer than your body um, I feel it. Uh,
lust has many partners. When you talk about lust, you, you got sex and clothes. You got sex and money. You got sex and power. You got sex and music. Sex and fame. Wine and sex. Sex and cars. Drugs and sex. Sex and employment. Sex and friendship. Sex and household appliances. What does a woman in a bikini have to do with selling a Maytag machine? I uh, feel it here. Uh, I could tell you that you look good. I could tell you that the thing is glorious. I could say the thing is stupendous. I could look at you and say it's splendiferous. I can say a thing is superb, every bit of it. But if I don't say it's sexy, I haven't said a thing about it. Uh, sex has become the superlative uh, etymological term, the epithet extraordinaire. Uh, you got to say it's sexy. Uh, you can't buy anything without it. You got to have jeans and commercials and, and drink motor scooters, uh, folk washing clothes in bikinis. It, it's just sex and lust, and it's just woven into our existence uh, until you don't even know why you're driving so hard to keep yourself free and spotted from the world. That's because on our society, every indulgence on all levels come to us. You got homosexual cruising. You got heterosexuals bar hopping. You got teenagers going, hitting on each other at school. And, and the age is getting lesser and lesser. I, I feel like preaching now. <laughs> Uh, you got pressure. Oh, God, do you have pressure. Enormous pressure, peer pressure. You lie when you don't. <laughs> if somebody says, oh, you ain't had any sex, you start lying about how much you had. <laughs> and if you do, you lie. You're just lying either way because it's now a thing of folly if you haven't been with somebody. <laughs> Where is all the virtuous and the virgins and the chaste men and women? <laughs> You feel like a fool if you haven't been with somebody. Can I preach this thing for a minute? <laughs> Give your neighbor a high five and say, get it together. <laughs> You're going to another level. <laughs> get it together. Touch somebody else. Say, it's not about temporary now. <laughs> I'd rather be alone <laughs> than be messed over another time. <laughs> Come on, Pat. I want to hear something. <laughs> Uh, shake somebody's hand like you're going to shake it off. Uh, and say, God's got the best for me. Uh, that's why he's making me the best I can be. Uh, because it's going to be the best with the best. Uh, woo, I feel it here. Uh, lust seems to deliver paychecks uh, of pleasure, yes, of joy unspeakable. But the problem with lust is it is a two-headed monster. Uh, it leads from joy unspeakable to sorrow unimaginable. Oh, how quickly does the paycheck end and lead to a crashing disruption of relationship? I'm here to project to you that we have messed up a whole lot of good relationships over sex. We could have been real good friends had we not been to bed. We could have really praised God and enjoyed walking in the church had we not ended up in some nest. I feel it here. Unwanted lust babies. Products of uncontrolled passion. Offsprings of heated lust. Raised to follow up where grown-ups left off. Unwanted conceptions. The enormous pressure of uncommitted partnerships. You find out whether somebody really cares about you when you come up pregnant, uh, visit you every day, drove across town every week, uh, hung with you every chance they got. Uh, but when they heard you were pregnant, uh, it was all over. Uh, never saw them another time. I might as well tell it. Uh, we out here together, shake somebody's hand uh, and say, I'm ready for something real. Uh, I'm sick and tired of being played with. Uh, oh, God. Then soon the pleasure turns to nothing. Ah, uh, we call it liberation, but it's not liberation. Because
because anything you can't say no to, you are not liberated from. I don't have to say yes. I ought to be able to look you in the face and say, I don't need your car. I don't need your money. You ain't got enough money for my body. Somebody ought to get angry in here. Get angry. Hit somebody with a high five. And say, I'm angry with myself. I got to go to the next level. I should have achieved a PhD. Should have had an MD. Should have had a big house. Should have had some money. And I let some knock need lover that didn't even know how to love mess up my future. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. Give somebody a high five. Say it'll never happen again. I'm on my way up. And I'm going all the way with God. Oh, can I preach like I feel it? Lust seeks to have what it can't afford. Touch your neighbor and say, you can't afford me. Lust seems to have. It wants to have what it cannot support. You better go on with your little poor self. I feel it here. Can I preach like I feel it? Honey, when you come out, come out in your mink coat. Man, when you come out, come out in your big car. Come out looking good. And let somebody know I ain't coming down there to get you if you can't come up here on my level. I feel the Holy Ghost. Every now and then you ought to look somebody in the face when they got all that sweet talk and tell them, what are you bringing to the table? can get a body anywhere, but I need a mind right about now. I need something here. The Hebrew word was yada to know, and it meant to have sexual relationships with. It did not deal with promiscuity. It says, know me. Touch your neighbor, say, know me. It was full commitment. You got to know me. Folk will tell you today, I love you. And I'm crazy about you. How can you love me when you don't even know me? We've been out one time. And you want to crawl up in my bed. The devil is a liar. Not over no $30 dinner, honey. You don't like preaching tonight. You got to come on up better than that. The Greeks call it epithumius. And it always suggested not bodily activity all the time. The Hebrew said naposh. It's like a yearning, a longing after. Therefore, it begins to seek folk coming into your life for what they can take. But the people you need in your life is not coming in for what they can take. But they need to come in for what they can give. Lust takes, but love gives. You feel the Holy Ghost in here. I feel a breakthrough coming. I need somebody to give me. I've had enough folk to take from me. I need somebody to lift me. I've had enough folk to pull me down and leave me in confusion, hating myself over what I allowed them to do. But God told me stay single till I send somebody up in your life that has as much to offer as you have to offer. Shake somebody's hand like you gonna shake it off. Tell them, neighbor, I ain't up it, but I am valuable and I need value in my life. I'm sick and tired of running after somebody that I don't know where they are. I need somebody that wants to be with me. I feel like having church here. Can I preach like I want? Can I preach like I feel it? The Bible says that lust is the same word for covet. That the individual wants something that don't belong to them. And when
when God has cleaned you up, washed you with his blood, put your mind back together, got rid of all of your junk, I feel like preaching. Tell your neighbor, I can't go back in that. God brought me out with a mighty hand. I'm getting ready to close, but I feel something pushing me. Lust becomes the obsessive search for sexual satisfaction, which derives a thirst that no sexual satisfaction can quench. When folk are full of lust, cannot reach like I feel it. I feel at home, Bishop. I might as well tell it. You get with folk today. You don't know what you got to deal with. Folk love to throw chains over the middle of the top of the house because they push technique so far that it's all about technique. And most folk who deal with technique have lost their feelings. I need somebody. Not for technique, but I need somebody who feels my heart, who feels my mind, who feels my soul, who feels my spirit, and I don't want you up on me if you don't feel all of me, because we can become one physically, but not mentally, not emotionally, not spiritually. And it won't last. Give somebody a high five. Tell them it won't last until it's mental. Tell them it won't last until it's spiritual. Tell them it won't last until it's emotional. Tell them it won't last until God sanctions it. So I'd rather be with Jesus because I'm alone. But not alone. Shake your neighbor's hand. With me, go shake it off. And say, neighbor, you don't see a man with me. Because my man is not seen with the naked eye. But my man is revealed with the Holy Ghost. The smile on my face. He put it there. The joy in my heart. He put it there, the power in my soul, he put it there, he died that I might have the right to the tree of life, touch your neighbor, say I know love, I know love, love woke me up this morning, love started me on my way, made a way somebody say neighbor we gonna make it honey we gonna make it man we gonna make it we're too valuable can everybody do we need somebody that's valuable Jesus is the standard
single, but not alone. It's better when you have narrow parameters because it makes selectivity easier. I thought God was horrible in his declaration of one man, one woman. What kind of thing is that, Lord? But God is always right. It is better to give a hundred percent of yourself to one woman than twenty percent of yourself to five. God is always right.